There's nothing quite like watching a film being projected right in front of you. From pulling out the projector and setting it up, dimming the lights, and then putting the film onto it and carefully threading the film through the mechanisms until it's ready to go, to turning it on and seeing the images come to life. This is a 16 millimeter projector, and 16 millimeter projectors have been around since the dawn of this format from really high-end ones that would go in theaters all the way to ones that you could set up in your own living room to watch your own home movies or short films or even feature films on this amazing format. What on earth and in the sea? At the time when the earth became hot, at the time when the sun was darkened, at the time when the heavens turned above. As it's running, you can tell how wonderful it is to just sit and watch something with this going in the background behind you. So that's kind of what you encounter when you're watching something in a small room or an apartment or something where this is just happening constantly. Are you sure it's on? I can't hear a thing. It's Whisper Quiet! This is a Kodak pageant, and the pageants were very popular 16 millimeter projectors. They were made by Kodak, but you could also get ones that were made by Bell & Howell, which was a huge name. And there are so, so many different models. Movies on 16 millimeter aren't as prominent though as 35 millimeter, which is what most movie theaters would have been using. Really big, powerful projectors that were set up to handle really large rolls of film that would show an entire movie generally printed and distributed on 35 millimeter. But 16 millimeter might have been shown in your own home if you were shooting home movies on 16 millimeter. You could watch them in classrooms with educational stuff or they might have been available at your local library to rent or to view on your own. 16 millimeter prints might have gone to TV stations in the early days or also might have been projected in cheaper and smaller cinemas in comparison to much more expensive 35 millimeter. 16 millimeter was a cheaper option so there were a lot of things shooting on it and a lot of people projecting and watching it. When it comes to putting film through a projector, you're either watching a print, which is a positive copy of a negative, which is either the film that went through the camera, or if it's something more elaborate, a copy of the edited film that is completely done with music and titles and special effects and everything ready to go a positive copy that can be put through the projector. Or you're watching reversal film. Reversal film, unlike negative film, is positive film. It's a different film that goes through a different chemical process and comes out as a positive. Currently, you can do that. If you shoot 16 millimeter, you can shoot Tri-X, which is Kodak's reversal black and white film in 16 millimeter. Or you can shoot Ektachrome, which is Kodak's color reversal film. This reel here is about 900 feet of film, which is like a 25 minute short film that I came across in a thrift store. It's just this little short, which is audio and sound over top of pictures of stamps that have been turned into little narratives. And it's stuff like this that is super interesting. And there is a whole world of collectors out there who look out for this stuff. Short films, educational stuff, and feature films. Over the past year, I have really fallen into scrolling through online listings for people selling entire feature films on 16 millimeter. I'm still very much away from that dream, I think, of collecting film prints because uh, I think Tarantino said it best when he compared that to um, drug use. A while back in the earlier days of the channel, I did talk about Super 8 projectors, and by comparison, they're much smaller, much lighter, and overall just more portable in comparison to 16 projectors. The pageant that I have is also a sound projector, so it has two lamps, one for projecting the picture up here, and one down here that is the sound projection lamp. This projector can read optical soundtracks on a 16 millimeter movie print, and that portion of the print is projected onto a sound head. Through all the gadgetry inside, it converts the optical soundtrack on the print 
into the soundtrack for the film. So if you plug a speaker in and you can watch sound movies on 16 millimeter in your own living room. Normally these projectors come with a speaker unit because they are to some extent portable with a handle on the top here. They normally have a cover that unbuckles off the front that actually has a built-in speaker, which is some really cool design. With these old prints though comes a lot of problems sometimes. Very often on older prints, stuff pre-1990s, pre-1980s especially, you encounter kind of two forms of degradation. One is vinegar syndrome. Vinegar syndrome is the result of what happens when some of these older print stocks start to just decay over time. It happens a lot, especially on like older, cheaper print stocks, stuff that wasn't made to last all of the time, especially in comparison to newer stuff, like stuff from the later 80s and into the 90s, and especially now as archival technology has greatly improved. Vinegar syndrome is exactly what it sounds like. It means that the film has started to smell like vinegar, which means that your film is decaying. Besides vinegar syndrome, you'll also come across a ton of prints that have a huge redshift for color. If you come across older 16 millimeter color prints, TV episodes, feature films, you might notice an immense redshift for the color. Cheaper print stocks that were used to make some of these prints just weren't made to last. That means that the colors and the dyes in the film have just slowly faded over time and you lose a ton of color. For 16 millimeter projectors, you have to thread these guys up. They're not like Super 8 projectors and like auto load projectors where you can just feed the film in. There's a threading diagram on the side down here which shows the film path and then it's up to you to thread it up properly or else your film might get wrecked when you're trying to project it. There's guides that snap open and close over these sprocketed rollers that have sprockets on one side so you can pull your film through, which means that you can use this on double perf or single perf film. It goes down behind the gate and there's a knob that will move all these mechanisms forward so that you can advance it manually. This pressure plate can also be removed so you can make sure that everything is moving functionally and keep things clean in here. Down here is the sound head and you only need to thread your film around this area if you're projecting sound prints. And below the sound head mechanism is the control for the sound focus. Because the optical soundtrack is actually being projected against sound components in order to generate our soundtrack, there's a little lens below the sound head here that allows you to focus properly on that portion of the film. Making sure that your sound focus is precise means that you can get a clearer sound off of the soundtrack. Now when it comes to my own stuff, uh, a lot of the stuff that I have shot that I have prints of or that are reversal film, I don't have too much, but they're all on these cores. And for projecting stuff on cores like that, I have what's called a split reel. A split reel is just one of these reels that comes apart like that. And then I can load up my film in the middle, screw it back together, and then it's ready to run through a projector. It's hard to do this stuff justice when I'm just recording the projection of it. Syncing up shutter speeds and everything with the projector can be a little difficult. This stuff is actually some of the very first 16 millimeter film that I shot and I was shooting really old expired print stock that I just came across somewhere. I've definitely overexposed all of this, but the most interesting part are all these strange blue dots that like dance across the image just because of how expired and like poorly stored this film was. This is just how it came out of processing. So it's a very interesting result, but it's definitely not what you would hope for if you're shooting something that you really want to turn out perfectly. I've also got some black and white film that was shot when I was in college. This is Orwo black and white, and there are things besides like Tri-X and Ektachrome from Kodak that I mentioned that you can get that can be processed as reversal film, especially for black and white, and Orwo has some of that stuff available. This was shot as a camera test when I was in school because one group wanted to do a project shot on 16 millimeter until the faculty told us that we couldn't because they had cut film from the curriculum. So that was definitely a bummer, but this short roll was shot when we were doing camera tests on things. I believe this was shot on an Arri SR2, but I can't quite remember. And I always forget when I pull this out that I'm in here. Uh, that's me like four or five years ago. I can't really remember. I do recommend Orwo stuff if you're looking to shoot some really nice black and white 16 millimeter. And I've also got this stuff, and this is color reversal 16 millimeter film, but it's not Ektachrome. Before Kodak resurrected Ektachrome back in like 2018 now, 
There was briefly available for Super 8 and 16 millimeter motion picture formats, Whitner Chrome. Whitner Chrome was an AGFA color reversal film stock that was available in limited supplies for a couple of years or something like that. That was a 200 ISO daylight balanced color reversal film. And in the void that existed after Ektachrome was discontinued initially in 2012 or so, Whitner Chrome was the only option. It pales in comparison in my experience to Ektachrome, but it was the only thing that people could shoot for Super 8 and 16 to be able to just project right out of processing. I always found it a little too warm and kind of yellowish in certain areas, and the 200 ISO of it gave you some really punchy grain, which isn't the best, especially in comparison to Ektachrome, which is a much nicer looking film. There's something very sad, but also kind of poetic about the fact that every time you put film through a projector, it slowly degrades. Dust and specks and scratches just inherently happen when you're handling film and when you're putting it through something like this and moving it at a pretty fast speed. Every time that you sit down and put something through a projector and watch it, it is just very, very slightly different from all the other times that it was projected before and the times that it will be projected in the future. Really, I would like a lot more 16 millimeter prints. But as I said, it's a bit out of my price range in terms of things to collect right now. And it's also things that I don't have space for and you wanna make sure that you're appropriately storing these things in well kept rooms with decent temperature and not like a lot of moisture year round and everything because again, these things are worth preserving and holding on to, whether it's stuff that you've shot yourself or it's stuff that you've bought. Uh, it's incredible to watch this stuff and run it through a projector. Wow, another great episode, right? I hope that you all enjoyed that video about 16 millimeter projectors. There's merch now, you, uh, starting uh, today for the channel. You can get stuff that says analog resurgence and a few different other little things just at the moment to get started. You can find a link in the description down below. You can finally stop looking like this and start looking like this. And if that sells it, then that's maybe a concern. All this is just to support the channel and keep it alive. So uh, more, Super 8 and 16 and bigger projects in the future. Check it out if you're interested. Thank you guys. I'll see you all soon.